Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to the latest Irwin Mitchell webinar. Thank you for registering for this event and for taking the time out of your working day to join us. I can tell you that you've helped this, uh, you've helped to make this one of, if not the best attended webinars that we've done so far. And that's great once again to bring together our clients, community and colleagues for what looks to be a really interesting presentation. The subject matter of today's webinar is vocational rehabilitation for those living with a serious injury during the time of COVID. Now I've seen the guest list to today and it's many and varied and I suspect that there are two main reasons uh, why so many of you have decided to tune in. The first, well for those that have met or worked with Katya, uh, you'll know that it's always entertaining to speak or hear from her and of course to learn more about vocational rehabilitation and secondly practitioners across disciplines have been really challenged by COVID and in particular lockdown to look for ways, sometimes uh, innovative ways, to continue to deliver rehabilitation in all of its forms to our clients. Our clients are after all at the heart of what we do and I think that uh, all of us are duty bound to devise ways to equip, encourage and empower our clients through rehabilitation, even and perhaps especially when the going gets tough. So I have a couple of housekeeping matters. Firstly, the runtime of today's webinar is around 60 minutes. There will be a 35 minutes or so presentation from Katya with 20 minutes of questions at the end. Secondly, towards the right hand side of your screen should be a Q&A panel. And I firstly want to thank everybody who submitted a question before uh, today's session. There's been some really insightful questions and comments there, so thank you once again. Keep submitting them. If you have any questions along the way, type them into the Q&A section, submit them and they'll appear on my screen and Katia and I can deal with them at the end. The second reason why the Q&A panel is so important is that towards the end of the session, there will be a link posted in there for you to complete some feedback and I'd be ever so grateful if you did. Um, feedback means that we can keep evaluating and developing webinars such as this one. OK, so who are we and what are we going to be talking about today? My name is Keith Cundall. I'm a solicitor based in the Manchester office of Erwin Mitchell and have been for around 12 years and I deal with mainly brain injury cases. Uh, I'll be hosting today's webinar. But the main event, we are very pleased to have Katia Halsall with us today. Uh, Katia is a vocational consultant, functional evaluator and expert witness at Voc Rehab UK, a leading provider of specialist services uh, for vocational therapies across the UK. Uh, as I mentioned, the title of this webinar is Vocational Rehabilitation for those living with serious injury during COVID-19 and I'm really looking forward to it. Well, that's all from me for now. Katia, <coughs> over to you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Keith. Before, before we start, I just want to say how grateful I am that so many people have joined us today for this presentation. As Keith said in the introduction, I have been working with serious injury clients for many years now, and these conditions include amputations and spinal injuries, orthopedic injuries, brain injuries. And my company, Voc Rehab UK, has been instructed by a number of case managers, injury lawyers and insurers, and quite a few of them are here with us today. That's really great. But whatever your background is, we are here today for one specific reason to explore how vocational rehabilitation can help those people who live with a serious injury during the COVID-19 pandemic. Vocational rehabilitation is different from medical rehabilitation. Vocational rehabilitation is anything that helps a person to return to work. It is about empowering and encouraging our clients to be organized and determined and so today I will talk about how to support them specifically during the COVID-19 pandemic and keep them focused on their return to work goals. So let's get on. I'm a vocational consultant. And so a number of topics today will be covered from the vocational perspective, starting with the effect that the current situation has on our clients. <clears throat> We will be covering the motivational aspect of vocational support, how to focus on abilities, not just limitations, now more than ever. 
dealing with limiting beliefs and negative disabling language. I will talk about the changing job market. There will be some tips for your clients on how to think differently in order to prepare for returning to work. And what you can do as practitioners who work with serious injury clients to help your clients to, sell, to set vocational goals and return to work outcomes. There will be, of course, resources for you to take back to your clients on refresher, training, learning new skills and volunteering. Indeed, our clients can be affected by negative news and stories they have, that we have seen around us in recent days. For example, coronavirus is likely to result in the highest number of unemployed people in the generation. And it is, of course, understandable that people with health deficits get alarmed and dejected at new stories like that. Because historically, people with health deficits are invariably casualties of tough economic times. So it is very important to help our injury clients to learn how to identify with their skills and not their health limitations and how to prepare for going back to work now. So first of all, let's set expectations. This webinar is for you and for your clients who want to return to work and who require support. This webinar will not be helpful for those people who cannot work because of the number of health limitations that they have. And we know that not everyone will return to work after a ser serious injury. This webinar is not for those people who does not wish to go back to work. Perhaps after the injury, their life has taken in a different direction. They may have different priorities. You see, what I've learned from my work as a vocational consultant, there are three gr groups of people. Group number one are those people who want to be motivated to return to work and they know how to do it and they're proactive, they take st their own steps and their own actions. They may require very little support from the vocational perspective. The group number two are those clients who are not motivated to go back to work and not interested to be motivated. We cannot help those clients. And the group number three are those clients who do want to go back to work and who want to be motivated, but who might not know how to and how to go about setting their return to work goals. And these are really our typical vocational clients that come our way, mostly. I've mentioned motivation. Let me talk about motivation a little bit more. Well, it's a fascinating topic and I often mention it in my talks and presentations. Did you know that we are all motivated positively towards pleasure and we are motivated negatively away from pain. Personally, that is why I'd rather eat chocolate than go for a run in the cold rain. But in terms of focusing on vocational goals, frequently it is a fear of failure that motivates people away from engaging in their return to work goals and job seeking activities. So tip number one from my end would be using motivational techniques with your clients. If you don't know what it is, research it, find it, get training, use it. For example, you can ask questions to your clients. For example, how being in work can help you with improving social interactions, improving your finances, imp improving family dynamics. How being in work could help you to get a sense of achievement and satisfaction. And essentially, motivational interviewing for job seek seeking motivation is about helping your clients to explore and highlight the benefits of being in work. And tip number two, I think the gr a great way to motivate people is to help our clients to see the preparation for work and job seeking activities as a challenge and not a pain, as a project and not as an unpleasant chore. So the big question is, how is vocational support for serious injury clients different now during the COVID-19 pandemic compared to the last year and to the year before? My answer is very simple. It is even more important now. It is even more important to help our clients, injury clients, 
with setting well-defined and well-structured vocational and return to work goals to help them to focus on their abilities, on positives, building their confidence, essentially helping our clients to feel empowered so that they are strong enough to cope with the increased negativity around us in the recent months and be able to see opportunities around them. What inspired the idea of the idea of this webinar is John's example. John is somebody I know and John has managed just secure a job during the pandemic, not just any job, but the job of his dreams and he managed to almost double his previous salary. So I just had to ask John, how did you do it? John told me that he decided to prepare to see what he can do now. Specifically, in his situation, he found refresher training, he updated his CV, and he created a portfolio of his work to present to employers. And what's happened, it appears to me, that John has made a great use of his time whilst being at home during the pandemic. So John's example has made me think, if John could prepare and get a job in the midst of the COVID pandemic, can others? And isn't this a situation that a lot of our clients are in? They are at home, possibly out of work, not found work yet or being furloughed. Can they use the time they have on their hands now effectively? Can they enhance the activities of daily living and any rehabilitation that they may be receiving by adding return to work preparation? And why is it important? That is because work is important. Working with people with serious injuries, a vocational consultant, I am only well aware how challenging it is for someone who has been affected by a serious injury or a disability to plan their return to work, even in the most favorable times, even more so now. Work is one of the aspects of their life that has been affected by their injury. It is a well-known fact that being in work, in good work, is good for people. That's because work provides us with routines, a sense of achievement, social interactions, financial independence. Essentially, work is part of our identity. That is why vocational rehabilitation is a must for any serious injury client whenever appropriate. Our clients are more likely to develop negative and limiting beliefs about their ability to get a positive job seeking outcome. And even more so now. Not only a lot of our clients struggle to deal with negative information about their health. I often come across of negative and disabling language in reports, for example, that I'm reading in medical reports. Doctors using sentences or any significant others actually. Uh, sentences like this, this is a very bad injury, you cannot work. Added to this, they have to deal with negative news about the pandemic too, such as job losses and um, lack of jobs in the area, for example, and that is just too much for many people. The emotive and negative disabling language and negative news have a detrimental effect on, on many of those clients. So my tip would be here is that what I say to my clients is that do not focus on negative news. They're here, don't ignore them, don't focus on them. This is because news channels pick up stories that make the biggest impact on human emotions, selecting the most shock shocking news and therefore often negative news. It's uh, useful to be, a well, uh, be well aware of this. And do focus on positive news and inspiring stories around you about people who managed to achieve things, managed to turn the business around to adapt to the current situations. People like John, who just secured his job during the pandemic. Uh, in June, there were some BBC News articles on people like a wedding florist who has managed to change, change her business and adapted to be, becoming a delivery florist and managing, managing to sustain her business because of that. A hairdresser who, who was saying that they built a waiting list of 2,000 people ready for reopening last week. 
Again, my tip will be here is motivational interviewing, and that's how you can help your clients. For example, your client may be saying, I cannot work because of my health deficit, or there are no jobs because of pandemic. Motivational interviewing can help you to positively and respectfully challenge this negative and limiting beliefs and negative language. For example, yes, there are bad news, but what are the good news also? Yes, you have limitations with your function, but how many hours could you work? What tasks could you do? What can you start with preparing for work? Some of the vocational clients are still employed, but most of our clients are no longer employed and they can't do the work they used to do before the injury. So my tip here, and that's how usually um, I do my work with my clients, is start with identifying a functionally suitable occupation or a number of occupations based on their skills and career preferences. What we do next is that we make a plan what needs to be done to maximize this particular person's chances to get that job and to engage in that occupation. This plan consists of incremental tiny baby steps that lead to the desired outcome for my clients. I strongly believe that it is important to empower and encourage my clients to take independent steps rather than do things for them. We do things with them gradually stepping aside as they gain confidence in their own abilities. Vocational rehabilitation is all about real people with real problems, real lives. Meet Mark. Mark here for the purpose of this presentation is our hypothetical client, somebody with a serious injury, whatever it might be. Say Mark lost his job. He doesn't know what else he can do. He can't do the same tasks as he used to do before the injury. Once you go back to work, he doesn't know how to go about it. And not sure where to start. Natasha will be changing the slide in a minute. Not only Mark now has his life turned out by his injury, his life's plans are now even more uncertain in these difficult times and his motivation for returning to work may be affected even more. For example, it's not uncommon for serious injury clients to tell me to say something like this. I won't be able to find work because of my health deficits and now because of the COVID pandemic. So again, my tip and advice to Mark, our hypothetical client, would be start preparing for work now. Benjamin Franklin said a long time ago, if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail. And this is where vocational rehabilitation can be so useful for a serious injury client. It certainly feels like a new world with so many changes in the last few months in so many different aspects of our lives. Now, during the pandemic, pandemic we need to be talking to Mark about his preparation for work, how he can plan his return to work for the future, what kind of resources could he use to encourage Mark to explore and seize opportunities? And essentially, it is important right now in the midst of pandemic to say to our, to our Mark, it is possible to find work. Let's focus on abilities and what can be done. Why? Because if Mark seizes the opportunities now, he will be much more likely to return to work and essentially to improve the quality of his life in the future. Mark needs to be well aware and stay well informed about the changing work pattern. For example, for example, only this morning, the BBC News article that I've read was talking about um, the government subsidizing jobs for young people only to this morning. The changing work pattern means that there are some things we know for sure. So, for example, some jobs and industries that we see on a day to day basis are more affected than others. But even within the same industry, I've got a couple of local restaurants that are in my area and one of them has got closed down completely when the pandemic started. 
whilst, whilst the other one is working 24 seven, delivering food to um, local residents. Within the same job family, food, for example, we see that uh, work, perhaps work options and opportunities within pubs and restaurants sort of down right now, whereas jobs in the food production and delivery is on the up. Mark needs to keep an eye on are there any jobs that are in less demand, perhaps maybe stay clear of the travel industry for now, certainly for the nearest future, things like travel consultant, customer service within the travel industry. It is important to know that some jobs are now in more demand as well than ever, than ever before. And some industries and some employers may be recruiting more people. So Mark needs to be really keeping an eye on things like what are jobs that are in more demand right now? Maybe some jobs that could be done online from home using the phone. The question here is, will we work from home more in the future? Maybe less travel. But you know what? Could this to be to our clients advantage? If somebody has skills, but limited abilities to apply these skills, for example, they may have a limited ability, they might struggle to drive and travel, they may have maybe suffering from fatigue or limited ability to concentrate, they really need to pace their activities. For those clients working from home and the ability to plan their own day and to pace their activities will be ideal. Michelle Obama said in her book <clears throat> that a failure is a feeling before it becomes an actual outcome. During the pandemic, vocational rehabilitation can help injury clients to focus positively on job seeking and on preparing for work and preventing this feeling of failure to become a real thing. As people who work with serious injury clients, we need to help Mark to think differently. The tips are here on the screen for you. So for me, for the first thing that I do with my clients is helping them to see that they have a choice. And that's the key. This is important because our hypothetical client, Mark, says to himself that he cannot do something like I will never work. No one will employ me. Nobody will employ a person with a health deficit. Then there is no room for anything positive in this negative statement. And so my tip here would be to help Mark to rephrase and reframe the way that Mark describes his situation. Shifting from the negative state to a state that allows a choice. And by, by doing this, opening doors and allowing the possibility of a different outcome. For example, what if we rephrase Mark's negative and limiting statement like this? I have a health limitation, however, I also have skills that could be valuable in the workplace. I am good at things like that. And in this way, Mark now has a choice. He opens the door to possibilities, to different positive outcomes, return to work outcomes. This new statement implies that there is something that Mark could do to help himself to return to work. Another tip for helping Mark would be to, for example, to, do, to, to get him to do exercises and writing down Mark's skills and his unique personality qualities, that's useful. And another tip would be to help Mark to see what is it that in his control. Even now during the pandemic, for example, I cannot control the COVID pandemic or the travel industry troubles, but what can I do now? What is in my control? What can I do now to prepare myself for returning to work in the future? What is in my control? For example, doing a CV or reading up on how to set up their own, his own business. For any vocational intervention, first of all, setting an outcome, what needs to be achieved is a must. Otherwise, there will be no direction. Stephen Covey, a motivational coach, said when planning stand for something, begin with an end in mind. And so using positive language and present tense, Mark's, Mark will need to set his outcome. 
For example, it is September 30th of the 30th of September 2020. I am back in work. Mark's outcome here is I am back to work or I am prepared for work. How did I get here? Now that we've got out our outcome, Mark will need to be learning and setting stepping stones, which will be his goals and what needs to be done to achieve this outcome. And these goals will bridge, will create this bridge between Mark's current situation and his desirable outcome. These goals are manageable and incremental steps. So how to do this? So if the outcome is I am back to work, Mark goals could be preparing his CV, gaining new skills by volunteering, maybe learning how to answer interview questions. These goals should be achievable. And if they're not, then break them down further with Mark. Sit down with him and think about, well, you, you can't do your whole CV right away. Could you do one section of the CV, then another one, then another one? The goal should be measurable. How does Mark know that he is ready to answer a particular interview question? The goals must be meaningful. They have to mean something. In particular, how they will get Mark closer to his desired outcome. And talking about stepping stones, volunteering could be a great, great stepping stone. Or it could be actually an outcome for some of the clients who cannot engage in paid work for whatever reason. We had questions about possible volunteering options for clients during COVID. Do It is a great website to find volunteering options locally. And if you type working from home, you can find options for people to do working from home and using computer, for example. Be My Eyes. It's a volunteering resource for creating a more accessible world for visually impaired individuals. Catch a fire for those people with professional skills who wish to volunteer to consult and offer vital advice for nonprofit organizations. School in the cloud is about creating online self-organized learning learning environments. Volunteering with missing maps means that uh, volunteers help by mapping out areas where crisis teams and humanitarian organizations are trying to meet the needs of vulnerable communities and respond to disasters. And the tasks for a volunteer like this will include looking at satellite images on, com on the computer and then adding buildings and road to maps. Well, how about that? Zooniverse volunteers participate in research projects such as art and history, physics and literature, space and social science, sciences. Grow movement volunteers help budding new businesses in developing countries. Once you complete a 12 hour ment 12 mentoring sessions, you will be able to mentor a new business on improving the business performance. Another volunteering option is crisis text line and volunteers answer texts from people in crisis. You will receive, first of all, a 30 hour training to help you to navigate through crisis intervention. Learning Alley supports students with learning difficulties such as dyslexia and visual impairments. Volunteering during the COVID-19 pandemic can help to improve Mark's skills. Give him a sense of satisfaction and enhance his CV. Plus, this you can see free training is available, which could be quite valuable. So let's talk about know-how for Mark and what he could do now to prepare for work. And remember, we said that Mark is a client, hypothetical client with a serious injury who lost his job. He doesn't know what he can and would be interested in doing. So therefore, Mark could start with identifying his career preferences, his likes and dislikes, write it down. He could make a list of his skills. What is he good at? And this is a good exercise both for building confidence and adding things in Mark's CV. Mark could start thinking about deciding on what kind of environment he may want to work, what kind of people he may want to work with, what kind of salary he may want to, to earn, geographical location, hours and shifts he may want to do, 
So really the tip here would be working through these topics would help Mark to do a gap analysis of his situation. What does he already have in terms of resources to his advantage, such as what kind of professional skills he has already, qualifications, qualifications, etc. And also what is missing? Does he need to renew his qualifications? Maybe learn something new, maybe volunteer to get new skills, maybe do computer skills or skills refresher. Can all of this done now? Can all of this be done now during the pandemic? Absolutely. Will it help our Mark to enhance his employment opportunities in the future? Absolutely. So know-how and tips here. Mark should be keeping an eye uh, on what's going on and do regular research who is recruiting now, perhaps locally to him. Opportunities, what jobs may be requiring digital skills he may be interested in. To prepare a good CV, finding a good template, checking spelling in the CV, the fonts, ask family on their feedback and use the family and friends and internet as different resources. And that might help him to improve his situation and, and uh, gain new information. And talking about resources. I've put a couple of uh, resources here for you to pass to your clients in terms of how to create CVs and prepare for a job interview. In my work, I use many more and we use, for example, mock interview practicing, but this is something your clients could start with. Add CCV templates look really, really fancy. Microsoft Office provides support with CV templates. On the screen here, training refresher is available at no cost, a low cost, and people can help using these training providers gain skills and improve their skills in business, finance, accounting, self-development, IT and software, office productivity, design and marketing, lifestyle, photography, health, fitness, music and teaching and many more uh, areas. And now did you know quite a recent news as well that Microsoft commits to helping 25 million people to acquire new digi digital skills needed for the COVID-19 economy. Here's another one for you. For Mark, the COVID-19 pandemic is not the time to do nothing. For Mark, the COVID-19 pandemic is the time to start focusing on his abilities, not limitations. What he can do right now, today. So let's break this down. Using motivational interviewing techniques, we need to help Mark, our hypothetical client, to explore the benefits of being in work. We need to help Mark to set his desired vocational return to work outcomes. It should be very specific, using po positive and powerful language. I am prepared for work. I am in work. I would suggest that Mark set specific time scales for himself, for his goals as well as for his outcome. For example, I am starting preparing for work today at 11 a.m. And then Mark should make a plan based on the outcome that he wants to achieve. And really the component of Mark's plan are the milestones we've spoken about earlier. They have to be realistic and manageable. For example, no point for our Mark setting a goal of completing his CV by 12 p.m. today. It, it takes time and effort. So the tip here would be but what can Mark do today by 12 p.m. today? Maybe he's just he could start work on preparing a draft of his personal statement, which is also part of his CV. Mark's plans should be flexible and adaptable, and Mark should be reviewing them on a regular basis as he makes progress to see what may be no longer relevant and whether any other priorities may arise. We should encourage Mark to make his return to work preparation a regular thing, a habit. Mark should not should learn to understand that he needs to be accountable for his own actions and not really to us as people who support him, but to himself. 
And for example, if something has not been done on his plan, Mark should be honest with himself and to really ask himself a question, what stopped him? The tip questions you could give to your Mark is to perhaps help him to discover who is responsible for achieving that specific goal? What can be done differently? Is this goal still important to you? What will you gain by achieving that specific goal? Again, what is in your control? What could you do now? And really encourage your clients and our mark to celebrate his achievement. Every big success is built on small and incremental steps. In summary then, what are the takeaways from this presentation, hopefully? First of all, in the best times, vocational rehabilitation is all about focusing on abilities and not limitations. <clears throat> it is about championing the things that our clients can do and not being blinded by what they, can, by what they cannot do. How is it different now in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, it is even more important. The second takeaway here, that there are still jobs available. And there's a likelihood that change, the changing job dynamics could mean that working from home will become far more acceptable, acceptable in the future. And this may be beneficial to some of our serious injury clients as it will remove the need for traveling and allow them to pace their activities and dealing with any mobility problems. And the third takeaway perhaps here is that we can support our clients in a meaningful way by encouraging them to make the best use of their time now, the time that they already have, staying at home, to research the job market, learn new skills, attend online training courses and perfect their CVs or perhaps to research how to set up, set up their own business. Early in my talk today, I told you about John, who was able to secure his dream job just a couple of weeks ago. So if John could do it, could other people? Like Mark? Absolutely. Can vocational rehabilitation be helpful for those people living with a serious injury during the COVID-19 pandemic? Absolutely. In this challenging time, vocational rehabilitation is especially important to help serious injury clients like Mark to focus on their abilities and help them to plan what they can do now to prepare themselves for returning to work. Thank you. Gotcha. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, we, we We've got a, a number of questions. I'm just looking at the Q&A screen now. Uh, so again, thank you to everybody who's put the questions through. Um, I, I, I picked out some, Katia, for us to have a look at now. Uh, the first question I have to say, and I'll be checking where this question came from, but it sounds as if you've written this question, Katia. Um, and it's, uh, when is the best time to refer a client uh, for vocational rehabilitation? Um, so again, I'll, I'll be checking the source of that, but, but perhaps you could respond to that. Well, it could have been my question, but I was asked this question quite a few times uh, during my work with my serious clients and uh, I am prepared to answer it. So I think that return to work should be mentioned to any serious client within a reason at the as early as possible, perhaps when uh, an INA is being done. And as um, because vocational rehabilitation could be used as the planning tool to plan for the future. The biggest benefit I see in vocational rehabilitation is to help people to prepare for returning to work. It doesn't mean that would be, they will be forced to go back to work on Monday morning, 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. Vocational rehabilitation can be, can be used to map and plan uh, activities for uh, and, and return to work pathways. For example, firstly, an assessment could help to set outcomes and goals, what kind of occupations this client may be, may be able to do and may be interested in doing, and how to plan, how to go about it, and how to implement this plan as well. And really, vocational rehabilitation, more often than not, I think should be part of any rehabilitation process within the reason. And, and the criteria, I guess, here could be when a client can consider some kind of work, volunteer or paid work, now or in the future, motivated to consider return to work preparation 
Um, and of course, for those people who are still employed, we need to start talking to the employers and uh, rebuild communication and all of these wonderful things that could be helpful for these clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think that that's an interesting response. Um, we, we've and it sort of dovetails in nicely to the second area that I've got to ask you about. And I say area because we've had probably uh, well a, a large number of questions about virtual sessions, virtual um, uh, meetings, and assessments. Uh, and allied to that, uh, a question uh, about whether or not you're doing face-to-face -face sessions. Uh, thank you, Kate H at the OT. I won't say your surname. So I suppose the the the, the question to put to you is um, is how do you ensure that virtual sessions, if indeed that's all you are doing at the moment, are delivered in a way where you can obtain maximum benefit? Because we're all dealing, I'm sure we're all dealing with Teams and Zoom meetings with, with our clients or, or other individuals. And, and it's a different discipline. It, it, it's a different skill set, I think, that you need. So how, how would you suggest um, that we utilise that for maximum benefit, Catcher? Thank you, Keith. I love virtual assessments. Don't be afraid of them. There's certain things that cannot be done virtually, but a lot of things can be done virtually as well. And I think we had a discussion with somebody that saying that actually virtual assessments and virtual support is something that could be seen as more empowering, really, because you're not sitting with the client next to, to them, not holding the hand. And vocational rehabilitation is not provision of care is the rehabilitation and empowering clients. It's kind of moving away from care. So do not be afraid of doing virtual assessments. They work beautifully. There's no reason why a career redirection assessment cannot be done virtually on the phone or by video call. And of course, years and years delivering vocational um, case management uh, virtually as, as using phones and, and, and visual um, means as well just taught me to think that they are very very effective so um, the point here here I guess just to for those people who may not be as used to doing virtual assessments it's a two-dimensional process really you've got a client on one end and you you not on the other end so to consider whether the client will see you or just hear you the, the key here for me is to establish a report and I'm sure if you can do it in face to face sessions, then you can do it also in virtual sessions as well. I think many clients would perceive the process itself of preparing them for work, asking all this. It's quite intrusive. So it's very important, I think, from my end to spend time introducing myself, who I am, what my role is, what isn't, what the assess assessment is about. What isn't it about to make sure the client is comfortable? What to expect on the day? I encourage the clients to ask questions and make sure they're comfortable. And that takes you know, a big chunk of time in the initial uh, part of the assessment. Make sure the client is comfortable, breaks water, make sure that they don't feel they chained to their phone or, or a video call and they don't feel that they can cannot step away um, and take a break or there's a baby cry maybe they need to attend to the baby and things like that setting expectations is very important within virtual assessments how long will it take what will it involve no interruptions should be taken to place during the assessment um, communicating with clients i mean a lot of our client our communication as we know it's not just talking isn't it? a lot of verbal communication non-verbal communication is going on so picking up clues on video calls whether your client may seem fatigued ask questions so i've noticed this can, can you tell me if you are maybe getting tired would you like to break the assessment down in two parts and maybe for me to give you a second call another day i think all of these things really help clients to uh, ask to build a report with clients in terms of logistics and Keith, we spoke about it when um, we were preparing for this webinar, the calls must be secure and choose up the platforms with um, where the calls are encrypted and video calls are encrypted is important. Also making sure that it has to be reflected in your report that uh, the call was taking place, um, the assessment was taking place during a video call or uh, an audio call and how it when the client was happy with that, he, they consented with this. I think that's an important part of it as well. There's negatives, of course, um, for video assessments for people who may have 
perhaps health deficits, physical or cognitive uh, disabilities. And I've recently attended a webinar on practitioners who do a lot of work with brain injury clients. So just to kind of judge, use your judgments on that. People with hearing difficulties, people whose English is not first language. I can relate to that very much. It's not my language. You know, would, would they understand exactly what you're trying to convey and being able to communicate with you? That's kind of my answer. Very long one, but it is it is my answer. Any well, other? Well, I, I think that's a, I think that's as, as good an answer as you could give. Um, I think it's important to remember that video um, or virtual sessions aren't always appropriate. It's about knowing your client, I suppose, isn't it? And, and I suppose you rely upon the instructions provided to you by well, by those instructing you. Um, so um, third question. And this is a really good question as well. Um, so thank you for for the person that submitted it. I, I, and I suppose this goes back somewhat to your um, section on motivation. Uh, but how do you encourage somebody with a, a, an acquired brain injury uh, back into employment um, when their um, view on their own injuries is, is is possibly disproportionate? Thank you, Keith. I love that question. When I saw that um, on the list, it was sent to us before this, this webinar, and I thought we must answer that. There's three aspects for me in, in, in this question and essentially in my answer as well. Um, a TBA, TBI, the brain injury has been mentioned here as part of this question. And of course, I think it's very, very important, first of all, to establish this desirable outcome and what would be that suitable occupation or occupations for this client and, and to so that they can aim to, to do something towards this outcome, to get clarity on their capacity for work. And I think for um, a, a lot of my clients with serious injury, but particularly my clients with brain injuries tend to, not all, but some, either underestimate their abilities to do certain things work-wise or overestimate their ability. So that's one thing. And I think it, the, having the clarity on what kind of work this particular client could do would really help them to start focusing on work and be motivational. The second aspect, since the brain injury has been mentioned, of course, is um, I find, and, and those practitioners who work with brain injury clients, that those clients may be lacking an insight and awareness in their own abilities and limitations as well. And so the question here would be, is this really about the problem with, is there a problem here with motivation or lack of it in the client? Or really, this is a problem with the insight and awareness really, and maybe that's something that needs to be worked on first, perhaps by an occupational therapist or a neurospecialist here. But in terms of motivation, let's drill down to motivation thing. What I say to all of my clients with any kind of health limitations is that the, the way I help them is to discover benefit, the benefits of being in work, because if they don't see the benefits, they, they, they wouldn't be motivated. And we all like this. I think it's a human nature. What's in it for me? And using motivational techniques to help the clients to explore this topic. Here's the examples for you. So help your clients to explore what makes work important for them. Ask these questions. What they will gain by going back to work? What wouldn't they gain, right? Where do they see themselves in five years time if they go back to work and if they don't? And there's tons of different questions you could really prepare based on your client's specific situation, bespoke to your clients. So that that's really, this is what it is, I would say, is that the motivation should, should be for any client and any injury, serious injury client, what's in it for them, and see the benefits of being in work. Yeah, and, and Katya, where does um, where does a cognitive assessment fall within that piece of work that you were just describing? Um, do you rely upon the the evidence that uh, is gathered? With, let's say it's a piece of litigation. Do, do you rely upon the cognitive assessments that are gathered during the litigation? Do you undertake any form of cognitive assessment of your own? How does that play into um, the issue of motivation and finding suitable work? Thank you, Keith. 
love this question. I think that it's important to consider all the information that you've been provided for for this assessment, for the specific client, for speci the specific assessment. But what I find is that a neurological assessment, broadly speaking, would usually, and any medical assessment to come to, 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 to think of it, will usually comment on, on a, a client's limitation and deficit, because that's a therefore. And for example, you re I will read in a report of a neurospecialist saying the client has memory deficits or concentration deficits as expected in many brain injury clients. But what we don't know is that how actually that reflects the ability to do work and particularly any specific work that may be suited to his, their skills and interests. So what we do, I'm trained to administer uh, um, cognitive testing from the vocational angle. And what happens is that we do a lot of activities and tests, uh, both physical and, and cognitive, with my clients. And it helps me to gather this information that we know that the memory may be affected. Specifically, how could, how is the memory affected to the point that they cannot physically, they cannot remember doing work tasks? So seeing them or watching them doing various non-standardized tests, standardized tests, is really helpful to identify how the memory may be affected in the workplace. And also using standardized, standardized tests tests and um, client self-reported measures questionnaires really helps together to put these pictures. So I believe that um, functional assessments, both physical and cognitive, should be part of um, uh, vocational rehabilitation and should form, form a part of uh, an assessment that will comment on the client's capacity for work. We do that a lot. Um, and, and it kind of proves really useful to match the client's physical and cognitive abilities and limitations to the demands of specific jobs. Yeah, OK, um, really interesting answer. Thank you. Thanks, Katja. Um, next question, um, I suppose, is the next step on from what we've just been speaking about, and it's what do you put in the CV? Uh, how how upfront or, or um, open do you recommend your clients be with regard to their um, their symptoms uh, in a in a CV or job application. Thanks, Keith. I think that th there's been a lot of debates within the vocational communities. I've seen those and t talks about what should and shouldn't go in the CV. My answer is very simple: what CV is for? And if we answer this question, rather right, question, if we answer this question, we we'll get our answer. And in my view, the main purpose of a CV is to get our clients or our foot through the door and get an interview. This, I don't think that CV is a good place and a good time to disclose health limitations. Your CV should be presenting your skills. This is what I say to my clients. It's about presenting your skills and presenting your abilities. It should show the employer what you can do, not what you can't do, what you can do. I think that uh, it is important to consider the disclosure of health limitations for various, re various reasons, for requesting reasonable adjustments, making sure the work is done safely, etc. And I'm sure there's a lot of legal guidance going on. But I think that for, for the CV purpose, it, it should be left out because there is a time and a place to disclose um, health limitations in, in later on. Yeah, and I think we've touched upon a whole uh, other area of uh, discussion uh, regarding equality and discrimination, which we've not got time for today. Uh, but but thank you, thank you, Katya. Um, we, we've had a we've had a question in um, uh, that uh, concerns well one particular sector, and, it, and it's asking for your your views on how the voluntary sector has been affected by lockdown. Um, one one underlining issue of, of what you've been talking about today is the fact that it's not all about um, remunerative employment. Uh, have you noticed um, how lockdown has had a significant effect on um, uh, voluntary uh, jobs in the voluntary sector? I think I think I have looking at uh, my local high street. Are, are you seeing that across uh, across the, the breadth of your clients catch up? Well, it just, interestingly enough, I think um, it, it seems like three and a half months, four months is a long time, but it isn't to kind of to, 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 to do stats on this kind of thing. And in fact, 
what I have seen with my clients is people actually securing, it's just happened, you know, paid position, but positions rather than voluntary positions. But I think it's just, it's just the way it has been. I think with my view on volunteering sector now and always is that it's it's always easier to get a volunteer job for somebody than a paid position. I think now um, we we see a lot of jobs and volunteer jobs that are done online and from home, which is a great thing. Um, but also, I've discussed it with one of my colleagues that with the lockdown, you know, sort of now easing off, hopefully, there may be um, high street charity shops maybe reopening now as well. That's worth checking out as well. I would certainly encourage uh, anybody who is off work and absent from work to consider volunteering if that's possible at all, either as a milestone or as, as an eventual outcome as well. I think it's a good one. I wouldn't say the, the jobs, that, volunteer jobs are down or up. I think they're there and I think it's worth exploring these opportunities. Yeah. Uh, Katya, we just had a question in and it's a, it's a bit out of uh, turn in relation to where we've, where we've come to with the, with the discussion, but I think it's a good question. Um, how do you deal with a client who's got unrealistic expectations of the kind of uh, role that they can fulfil? Um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, th this person doesn't struggle for uh, with confidence or motivation, obviously, and they feel as if their uh, their capacities w would open up a, uh, an avenue of work that, that you think simply isn't possible. I think it's about objective, if functional testing, possibly. Um, I think it's about facts and evidence and I think it's about communication and open talk with the client as well in the, in the, in the positively challenging way but also what makes our judgment the best judgment really maybe the client I know the clients with whom are recommended for example a sort of a, a much lighter uh, occupation and yet the went and gone and sustained a, a heavy type of work they they know what they want but I would just think to take the clients through the steps of clarifying what they can and what they cannot do. Again, I had a client who really wanted to become a, a personal trainer. Um, however, the functional assessment identified that a sedentary job because of his limitations would be more suitable. And we had an open discussion about it. There may be a place for psychological support here or counseling because it's related to, I think, adjusting to the injury and adjusting expectations, what this person could or couldn't do. And some discrepancies are very visible, isn't it? So you could clearly tell this person cannot do it and they're trying to do this as well. An open discussion, a clarity on functional abilities and limitations, um, and open discussions about skills um, and career preferences. I think it, it, it really, really, not I think, it really works certainly in my work and that's what I would advise to do. I hope that answers this question, but if not, if not contact me, that I love these questions, it's great. Let's talk about it further. Well, I, th I think it does answer the question, uh, but also I think it's, a, it's an issue of um, what you mentioned earlier on about building rapport, isn't it? Um, it, it's not all about delivering the news that somebody wants to hear. Uh, we've also got to be able to tell people what they don't want to hear. And uh, that, that's much better, I think, coming from somebody that, uh, that you've got some rapport with. Katya, we've got more questions than we've got time. Uh, we've got a little over um, a minute and a half left, I'm afraid. So uh, thank you to everybody who submitted questions. I'm so sorry for the people that we've not got round to. Katya will answer those questions. I'm going to make that commitment for you uh, uh, now, Katya. So I'll forward those on to you. Uh, and please do feel free to contact either Katya or myself with any, any other questions. Um, uh, Katya, thank you so much for that. I thought that was an excellent presentation. Um, it's a timely reminder of so much what we can be doing now to assist our clients, that we focus on abilities and not limitations. And it's really interesting what you say about the process of building confidence uh, and how the use of language is so important in motivating clients. And also that, you know, nobody needs to be making a giant leap. It's, it's about baby steps sometimes. And that, that's really interesting. Um, I, I think also what you've done is underline the importance uh, of work, full stop. Um, and the importance of work isn't really measured uh, about whether it's remunerative or not. Um, it has so many benefits uh, above and beyond uh, uh, any financial gain. Well, many thanks for everybody um, that uh, that's joined us today. Thank you. Um, it, it's, it's really appreciated. You'll shortly receive a, a link and a lot of people have been asking about this, a link to these slides. 
uh, and to the talk so that you can watch it and and read uh, at your uh, at your leisure. Um, I would be ever so grateful if again you would just take a minute or so to fill out the feedback form. It really is so important in helping us um, uh, assess and, and, and develop further uh, webinars for you to enjoy. Uh, please visit erwinmitchell.com uh, for more information about all of our services cover, covering all things legal and financial relating to COVID and well everything else. Um, thank you to Katya. Katya, wonderful, that was great. Uh, and a special uh, thank you as well uh, to uh, Natasha Allen, uh, who kept uh, uh, everything running smoothly today, uh, and to uh, Lynn Carrick-Leary. Um, so everybody, thanks again and have a great week.